in this set of three lectures will be um, delivered by Helena Gosh is it Gostiu or Gostiu, yes. uh -huh. and her talk is titled The Right to Misery in the Literary Slavic Dystopia. So the floor is yours, please. Okay. Um, I'm dealing with two different texts here, one Polish, one Russian. And since I didn't know who in the audience knew either language, I'm afraid I deal with translations. As the Italians say, traduttore, traditore. And I do believe that. But uh, better to uh, betray and be understood, okay? Um, my talk has two epigraphs. The first is by Stanislav Lem, the Futurological Congress. I quote, remember that the word utopia literally means nowhere, a never-never land, an unattainable ideal. The second one is from Blaise Pascal, Les Pensées. All of our reasoning ends in surrender to feeling. So, поехали. No. Oh, all right. This is very interesting. Okay. Uh, the outline that you see in my PowerPoint is simply to enable you to follow whatever flow of thought I have. So, both renowned and infamous for its vision of a utopian future, the Soviet Union conceived of an ideal society based on the twin goals of universal happiness and socio-political and economic equality, two desiderata to be achieved through enlightenment principles and industrial progress. Here's communism for you. This ambitious, if naive, project culminated centuries of Western thought, most notably instanced by the socialists Henri de Saint-Simon and Auguste Comte, as well as the British philosopher and economist Jeremy Bentham. Convinced that science and technology would solve most of humanity's problems, Saint-Simon advocated a society overseen <coughs> excuse me, by industrial leaders instead of the church and property classes, whereby productive labor and utility would triumph over antiquated faith and class inequality. Inspired by his views on economic organization, his acolytes, acolytes such as Comte <coughs> proselytized common ownership of goods and abolition of the right of inheritance in the interest of social equity. At approximately the same time, Bentham's number enamored introduction to the principles of morals and legislation of 1789, a notable date when you think of France, expounded the theory of utilitarianism, which defined the principle of utility as, and I quote, that property in any object whereby it tends to produce pleasure, good, or happiness, end of quote. Convinced that the sovereign impulse of pleasure and pain govern mankind, he declared that, quote, the greatest happiness of the greatest number should underpin all legislation. A telos fully embraced discursively, if not in practice, by the officialdom of the Soviet Union. These precursors of Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, whose views at sundry junctures converge with a seductive uh, utopian philosophies delineated in Plato's Republic, Thomas More's Utopia, which coined that term, uh, Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, and William Morris's News from Nowhere, manifestly stimulated, however indirectly, the communist ideology of the USSR. And these untested ideals fueled the entire Soviet enterprise, adopted in its 1918 constitution, as well as such utopian literary text as uh, Alexander Bogdanov's Red Star, with its socialist organization on Mars, Alexei Tolstoy's Extraterrestrial Elita, and its film adaptation by Yakov Pratazanov. Also in uh, Ivan Piryev's and Grigory Alexandrov's fantasy musicals, in promotional Soviet posters of the 1920s and 30s, and songs of triumphant unity, such as Avia Marsh and the International. 
Given the untested theoretical nature of utopia, its fullest expression in science fiction was predictable and accounts for the deluge of dystopias after the Soviet experiment imploded. Yes. As uh, the paper architecture of the early Soviet period attested, grandiose theories and lived life rarely coincide. The French playwright Eugène Ionesco acknowledged that discrepancy when he noted, apropos of his play, The Bold Soprano, I offer this in translation, the society I have tried to depict is a society that is perfect, I mean where all social problems have been resolved. Unfortunately, this has no effect upon life as it is lived." End of quote. Accordingly, writers in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc attuned to Fyodor Dostoevsky's impassioned challenge to rationalism and to the very concept of universal happiness, challenge to ration, sorry, impassioned challenge to rationalism and the very concept of universal happiness authored sci-fi works that satirized the utopian endeavor lambasting its reductive paradigms through polemical devices, devices that posited ostensible utopias only to reveal their inhumane totalitarian aspects traceable to the Grand Inquisitor chapter in Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karamazov, 1881. Arguably, the best and best known instances of Soviet era Slavic dystopia, uh, Evgeny Zamyatin's We, and also uh, Stanislav Lem's The Futurological Congress, sorry, <clears throat> exposed purportedly benign official <coughs> commitment as rigid control, equality as uniformity, happiness as haplessness, regulation as strangulation, and the positive as punitive. They dramatize what one critic has called independence surrendered or abolished for a mess of conditions security, end of quote, whereby abstract vision becomes experienced as existential incarceration. Recognizing the appeal of utopia, a persona in the Futurological Congress sums up 70 years of Soviet rule when he avers, quote, a dream will always triumph over reality once it is given a chance. Whereas Lem dwells on the illusory nature of a fantastic utopia, while Zamyatin emphasizes the coercive nature of such an overly overseen system, both detect an authoritarian figure as the specious sovereign practicing the Jesuitical argument of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor. That is the benefactor in We and Symington in the Futurological Congress. And of course, we can always talk about Stalin and now Putin in today's Russia. How does the idealistic theory of egalitarianism actualize as the pragmatic or cynical reality of totalitarianism in the dystopian novels authored by two of the most famous writers in Soviet Russia and Poland, whose texts, separated by half a century, slot neatly into the rich tradition of dystopia that developed most fully in the Anglophone, uh, Anglophone West, which for centuries elaborated various modes of utopia. Utopia, after all, was a Western brainchild. Indeed, Eugene Weber maintains, and I, I quote, the utopia is the characteristic manifestation of the Western cultural tradition. The search for order, the drive to harness nature and eliminate the unpredictable, are eminently uh, human and peculiarly Western, end of quote. Yet paradoxically, it was the Soviet East that attempted to implement those Western principles, with Zamyatin and Lem derived in their novels in terms also derived from uh, Western philosophy of classical liberalism and individualism, as represented by Locke, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche, but above all cast in literary form by Dostoevsky, Camus, and Sartre. Whereas Zamyatin relies on the biblical myth of paradise, modernist techniques, and an extraordinary female protagonist who articulates his novel's principled rejection of utopian thought, Lem operates by paranomasia, antic humor, and a space explorer given to lucid reflection as the author's skeptical philosophical double. <clears throat> 
a statement early in the Futurological Congress, summarizes his credo, and I quote, I would settle for nothing less than definitive, irreversible, full actuality. The converse of what the Soviet and its satellite states implicitly demanded of its citizens. The many differences between the two narratives notwithstanding, they coincide in their stance regarding unclouded happiness for all. Both initially and briefly sketch a utopia of apparent equality, order, unanimity and happiness, only to reveal all too quickly how that social paradise originates in self-delusion in we, and cognitive misapprehension induced by officially administered drugs in the Futurological Congress. Both pseudo-utopias eliminate individual identity excuse me, <clears throat> by universalizing a blueprint humanity, hence uniformed instead of normal clothing and the substitution of numbers for names in we. And both are based on inflexible faith in technology, science, and rationality, as well as the erroneous presumption that happiness constitutes humans' overriding aspiration. As Nietzsche in The Gay Science, 1882, maintains, happiness and misfortune are brother and sister, and twins. Yes. Moreover, typically for the genre, both utopias deny temporality, the heartbeat of life, after all. Assuming that solutions to socio-political problems may be established once and for all, utopias ignore history and evolution, so as to function in stasis and immutability, what Zamyatin in his novel calls entropy. Whereas Blaise Pascal believed, quote, our nature consists in motion, complete rest is death, end of quote, D503's uh, praise of the one state in we averse, I quote, only the four rules of mathematics are eternal and immutable, and only an ethic based on the four rules can be great, immutable, and eternal, end of quote. As Ralph Dachendorf felicitously phrases it, and I quote him, utopia as a whole remains a perpetuum immobile, end of quote. Zamyatin's I-330, that is the female protagonist, tackles this myopic inertness when in terms evoking yet pointedly uh, revising Marx, Engels and Trotsky, she argues for permanent revolution. And I quote, how can there be a final revolution? How can there be a final one? Revolutions are infinite. Elsewhere, she says, no one knows what tomorrow will be. Now all things will be new, unprecedented, inconceivable, end of quote. Tellingly, the biblical paradise, one of the earliest and most influential utopias, existed outside of time, changeless and eventless. And Zamyatin and we actually uses the myth of paradise you know, to good ends. In the second part of Lem's novel, in fact, the only action is the narrator's discovery that the apparent utopia of the future to which he has been transplanted is a dystopia. This static marriage of illusory manufactured happiness and illusory eternity uh, proves so inadequate that it necessitates technologically enabled enactments of hatred and violence inter alia encompassing murder invented by the tyrant Symington's company. As he explains, and I quote, Bentham's dream of the greatest happiness for the greatest number has been achieved, but it is not enough that we are happy, others must be miserable, end of quote. Significantly called Procrustics Incorporated, his company's name, of course, references the smith Procrustes in Greek mythology, who stretched or amputated passers-by uh, passers <clears throat> to forcibly fit them to the size of the iron bed he offered them, uh, and he offered travelers this uh, hospitality, um, which actually was his way of uh, controlling power. The term Procrustean bed accordingly illustrates the fatal consequences of uniformity, 
of an undifferentiated submit, submissive collectivity in which one size fits all. Perhaps Russia's age-old devotion to both secular and religious collectivity, what, the, what is known as subornist, accounts to a large degree for the preeminence of the utopian collective over the individual. Carried to a f uh, fantastic and fanatical extreme in Zamyatin's novel, where the, writer, uh, where the narrator excuse me, insists, we is from God, I from the devil. It is no accident that Freud and Jung, with their emphasis on an insight into individual psychology, did not take root in the Soviet Union, which imposed its priorities and prohibitions on the Eastern Bloc. And utopian ideology dictated that the self was an entity to be surmounted. Indeed, personal emotions, primarily love, proved the single most revolutionary forces to combat utopia, so-called utopia, in fact, dystopia. In Lem's novel, a passion for clear vision prompts the narrator protagonist rebellion against ready-made bliss created by drugs. The subversive power of sexual passion is the potent irrational drive, hilariously mathematized by Zanyatin D503 as the square root of minus one. That leads to rebellion. It is no accident that Plato, remember him in Utopia, classifies love with disease and drunkenness. You can only hope. Uh, precisely how D503 in We categorizes his passion for I-330 as criminality, poison, and sickness. At their most profound, Zamyatin's and Lem's novels reject happiness as humanity's supreme telos, instead positing freedom as the cardinal value. As a persona in We points out, the choice of Eden was, and I quote from the novel, happiness without freedom or freedom without happiness, the existential dilemma that confronted all citizens under communism. And in that sense, of course, the Grand Inquisitor section of Dostoevsky's uh, The Brothers Karamazov is indeed a prescient text. For Lem and his dystopian narrator, and I quote, true intelligence demands choice, internal freedom, end of quote. Conversely, according to the utopian novel, a genuine utopian novel, Walden II of 1948, by the behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner, Gesundheit, the only way to achieve freedom is by an illusion of freedom, which is no more than a conditioned reflex. That's the polar view. For Skinner, environmental variables alone account for human behavior. Nothing could be further from Zamyatin's and Lem's position. Indebted to Dostoevsky, the apostle of modern irrationality and the inestimable value of individualism and suffering, Zamyatin argues for freedom and the experience of pain and uncertainty, troped as I-330's enigmatic X, her whip-like slender body, the needle entering D-503's heart during intercourse, and her lips as bee stings and knife wounds. Lem, as an inveterate skeptic of totalizing answers to humans' insoluble yet inescapable dilemmas, and a proponent of clear-sighted rejection of all panaceas, likewise prioritizes freedom. Both posit the right to misery as an inalienable right. For uh, what partially defines humanity is the full spectrum of emotions. As I-330 declares, and I quote, I don't want others to want for me, if I want to want for myself, if I want the impossible. The benefactor in we, whose stone and cast iron hands symbolize totalitarian power and immutability, invokes Christ's passion to argue that the role of Christ's executioners was more difficult and important than that of the crucified savior and that people have always longed for, I quote, for someone to tell them once and for all the meaning of happiness and then to bind them to it with a chain. In other words, communism. That honorous duty elevates him, of course, to divine status, 
as the ultimate authority deciding questions of life and death, especially of death. And his view of humankind reduces all others to slavish weakness, as does Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor and Lem's Symington. Symington indeed explains to the protagonist, I quote, our lot is far more difficult. We must remain awake to watch over you, Lenin's Napastu. This is the last humanitarian act, the last moral obligation, a self-elected role that the protagonist justly derides as that of eschatological anesthetist. Wonderful phrase. In short, both novels unmask a society espousing egalitarianism, but in reality controlled by a self-exceptionalizing self tyrant, epitomized, of course, by Stalin. The impossibility of an ideal society founded on theoretically ideal principles invariably has resulted in dystopias that both Zamyatin and Lem eloquently deconstruct by satirizing the rhetorical falsity of such cynical structures with the specious pretensions. Indeed, you, you in Greek being the perfect place, is u, utopia is utopia, utopia, coming from the Greek u, no place, other than in specifically men's imagination. Thank you, that's it. Next talk uh, will be uh, given by who is going to read it? Ah. Uh, it is uh, titled Anarchy as Access to Space, Language, Imagination and Techniques. And for Eugene Kuchin of Russia, we will uh, read. Uh, what is your name? Drago. Uh, Drago, we will read it. Um, yes. You see, Eugene Kuchinov is absent, and I'll read his paper for him. I will take note of any questions that you ask and forward it to him. Okay, so the paper is titled Anarchy as Access to Space, Language, Imagination, and Techniques. As a theoretical framework of our presentation, we accept the difference between science fiction and extra science fiction. According to Quentin Milleso, who introduced this difference in science fiction, the relation of fiction to science seems to be the following. It is a matter of imagining a fictional future of science that modifies and often expands its possibilities of knowledge and mastery of the real. The implicit axiom of science fiction is that in the future the world, albeit under extreme conditions, will be subject to scientific explanation. Extra science fiction, in turn, defines a particular regime of the imaginary in which structured worlds are conceived in such a way that experimental science cannot deploy its theories or constitute its objects within them. The key question of extra science fiction, what should the world be, in principle not to be, the, not to be accessible to scientific knowledge, so as not to be the object of natural science. From the philosophical point of view, extra science fiction responds to the ontological problem, uh, to the ontological Hume problem, in the face of the impossibility of experience of the future. How can we be sure that in the future the laws of nature, as an object of scientific interest, will persist? For there is no logical contradiction in imagining that the laws will be modified in the future, and no experience of the past constancy allows us to infer that they will endure in the future. In short, Milleso proposes three possible narrative solutions to extra science fiction, all three being realized only partially in the examples given by him. Since they ultimately presuppose a scientific explanation of what is happening. The first solution is a catastrophe that takes part of the world that takes part of the world out of explanation with with the science. An example is Darwinia by Robert Charles Wilson. The, sex, the second sol solution is burlesque nonsense affecting the whole world but having nevertheless a certain origin and the scientific explanation. The proper example is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And the third solution is irreducible atmosphere of uncertainty which receives its explanation discharge. The example is Ubik by Philip Dick. Finally, Quentin Milleso calls René Bariavel's Ravage, the prototypical work of extra scientific fiction, in which strange causeless events that go into question the existence of stable and unchanging laws of nature do not receive any explanation. 
It seems to us that the difference between science fiction and extra science fiction rests on an implicit, on an implicit Marxist basis, although this basis is upside down. It is precisely in Marxism, especially Engels' work The Development of Socialism from Utopia to Science, that the transition from utopian socialism, unscientific fiction, to scientific communism, science fiction, is postulated. It is not coincidental that the recent issue of the online magazine of critical science fiction Big Echo, which is dedicated to uh, sesquicentury of Marx's capital, is bottomed on the fabulation that capital is a science fiction work. Marxism is a, forms, is a form of science fiction, with an emphasis on science, and perhaps all science fiction is latent Marxist. Milosov's conceptual gesture is not an attempt to return to pre-scientific utopia, but a hyper-Marxist critical gesture in which science fiction emphasizes the word fiction. Extra science fiction equals extra Marxism. We can call this position a Marxism without reserve by analogy with the characterization given by Jacques Derrida to George Bataille, a Hegelianism without reserve. Extra science fiction is, in a sense, a fantastic extract, extract of Marxism. The radicalization of the 11th thesis about Feuerbach, in which contingent changeability comes to the, uh, to the fore. It is not accidental that Milesso's definition of extra science fiction is, in general, apophatic, and also that he lacks examples for demonstrating the other regime of imagination corresponding to the extra science fiction. The problem is the limitedness of this implicitly Marxist basis for the difference between scientific and extra scientific fiction, since it ignores another political line of fiction, an anarchistic one. If Marxism moves from utopia to science and from fantastic fiction to scientific one, then anarchism is initially saturated with political suspicion regarding science, See Mikhail Bakunin's Statism and Anarchy, where he considers science as a problematic extract of reality and ambition for power associated with the support of this extract are questioned by him. Oh, quote, All these knights of science and thought, in the name of which they consider themselves, are ordained to prescribe the laws of life, are reactionaries, conscious or unconscious. End of quote. Anarchism is building a different line from utopian fantastic fiction to technical fiction, not science fiction. In technical fiction, the laws of nature are regarded as something that never covers the whole of reality and is always open to revision and redefinition on the part of anarcho-technical law lawlessness. It is on these techno-fiction grounds that the anarchist utopias of the Gordon brothers and the biocosmic exp experiments of Alexander Sviatogorod are built. Russian anarchism of the 1910s and 20s, pan-anarchism or biocosmism, proposed an original political and aesthetic model of access to space, which possessed a great heuristic and, utopia, and utopian potential, which due to political circumstances of the first half of the 20th century, was repressed and forgotten. In 1917, people from Belarus, the Gordon brothers, Abel and Wolf, founded a society of anarchist communists which they called the Union of the Oppressed Five. The Oppressed Five referred to those categories of humanity which endured the greatest hardships under the yoke of majority, worker vagabond, national minority, woman, youth and individual personality, five basic institutions, the state, capitalism, colonialism, the school and science, and the family were held responsible for their sufferings. The Gordons worked out a philosophy which they called pan-anarchism, in which prescribed five remedies for the five painful institutions that tormented the five oppressed elements of modern society. The remedies for the state and capitalism were, simply enough, statelessness and communism. For the remaining three oppressors, however, the antidotes were rather more novel. Cosmism, cosmism sorry, the universal elimination of national persecution, Genianthropism, the, emancip the emancipation and humanization of women, and pedism, the liberation of the young from the vice of slave education. The universal remedy for these five oppressors was pan techniques. The Gordons wished to liberate man's creative spirit from the shackles of dogma. For them, science, by which they meant all rational systems, natural science, and social science alike, constituted the new religion of the middle class. The greatest fraud of all was Marx's theory of dialectical materialism.
Marxism, they declared, is the new scientific Christianity designed to conquer the bourgeois world by deceiving the people, the proletariat, just as Christianity deceived the feudal world. Marx and Engels were the magi of scientific socialist black magic. In the early 1920s, within the framework of pan-anarchism, the ideological and aesthetic direction of, of anarchism, biocosmism, was developing, which advanced the same line of techno-fictionalism. Biocosmists were born out of the stormy explosion of the revolution, as their leader Alexander Sviatogor put it, with the promise to break, out of, to break out of Earth's gravity and achieve eternal life in space. Their platform was based on two principles, immortalism and interplanetarism. They formed an association, the creator of biocosmists, and even aimed to establish immor immortality Soviets all over the country and the world. And the Gordon brothers and Sviatogor developed their utopian techno-fictional models of access to space through language, imagination and techniques. There are at least three philosophical solutions to the question of language in the Russian cosmism of the first half of the 20th century. The Martian language of Alexander Bogdanov, the poetic theory of interjections in the series of Alexander Sviatogor, portrayed in biocosmic poetics, and the O-inventive language AO created by Wolf Gordon in the grammar of the logical language AO. Alexander Sviatogor and the biocosmic the, the biocosmists despised every abstract localism. They rejected the local, the localism of time, meaning human mortality and all idealisms that accompanied it, as well as the localism of space, meaning pride in one's race or homeland. Really, any urge for crass material achievement, any even proletariat, even proletarian in, internationalism, being a planetary localism, was suspect. Localism also belongs to the human language, which consists entirely of stabilized images or things. So localism must be destroyed, and this destruction must begin with habits, ossifications, and stabilizations in the language. Sviatogor proposes to release two fundamental forces from the stabilizations of language, interjections and series. Both these forces are effective ones. These forces are rep repressed through scientific, religious, and political stabilizations, and they are the very basis for interplanetary communication, for interplanetarism as such. The liberation of these forces implies the following. Firstly, descent to the bottom of speech, to the humanization which Sviatogor connects with, with the becoming animal, which he calls bestialism. Secondly, the release of the fundamental scream and the free binding of screams beyond the syntax and grammar through flexible modulations. Thirdly, translation of poetics into genetics and creation of immortal and interplanetary art organisms. Art organisms created by, by, by Sviatogor and named stickheads are strange poems reminiscent of spam poetry and automatically generated doorway texts. According to Sviatogor, they are designed to hack and reassemble in the form of interplanetary creatures those who read or listen to these texts. In 1919, the Gordon brothers published one of their key works, Anarchy in the Dream, or The Land of Anarchy. In the same year, Wolf Gordon announced the creation of the universal cosmic language AO. The Land of Anarchy is open to the oppressed five when they come together. The union of the oppressed five is formed in spite of not only science, science is being thrown off by its, uh, by its oppressed youth from its shoulders, but in spite of any legitimacy. So the union of the oppressed five is, con is a contingent one. The language AO, invented by Wolf Gordon in 1919 and constantly improved until 1924, when Wolf left the um, Soviet Union, is an immaterial technical object, an abstract machine that embodied the postulates of anarchistic linguistics. Perfectly streamlined, AO was based on vowel and consonant sounds combinations for speaking and number and sign combinations for writing, according to the version of 1924. Wolf Gordon even wrote sophisticated grammars and bilingual dictionaries with thousands of entries. AO was a remarkable achievement in terms of its novelty and simplicity. Grammar was, was embedded in the sound system and alphabet. The various sounds, letters and signs were symbolic representations that logically corresponded to nouns or adverbs or other parts of speech. All parts of speech were raised to the verbal stem, primarily to the verb to invent. 
All parts of speech were reinterpreted as verbal or invented in AO. So AO, for example, was written as XO and literally meant the invented. Through to the through to the anarchist ethic, the new language altogether disp dispensed with gender, signifying male oppression, like in Bogdanov's Red Star, as well as possessive cases and possessive pronouns and genitive case, signifying property and genitive relations. Pronouns were sounded and written as such, and of course there is no imperative mood in AO. The language AO should have, should have worked in the same way as the art organisms, to launch on a concrete corporal hardware to crack existing oppressing codes and to rewrite the body as an anarchic organism. We can say that the AO, which Wolf Gordon himself called social technical, is a language of social programming. So the first version of anarchic access to space, to cosmic interplanetary life, is access through the language, the language of effective hacking and of technical inventity. Anarchic projects of access to space through the language are the most thoroughly described and they're the most radical. Their essence consisted in an attempt to decentralize the language, activate and bring to the forefront its effective positivity and ultimately the release of the non-human in the human language. The languages thus created were to become languages for communication with non-humans, aliens, and also become the basis for cosmic anarcho-communism. Being constrained in realizing their projects through real politics, Sviatogor and the Gordon brothers are developing the practice of anarchy of the imagination, which consists of careful work with utopia and fabulation. Imagination and its peculiar hacking became a condition for access to space through utopian forward running and not, re not responding to the moral question of what should definitely happen in the future, but to the ethical question of what could happen in the future the possibilities for which are hidden in the present. The Gordon brothers called this forward-running regime of the imaginary a dream or madness. This mode of imagination is very different from the extra science fiction imagination regime, primarily because it does not correlate itself with science, with science in any way. The slogan, neither God nor nature, is often found on the covers of the Gordons. It referred to the strange thesis of the Gordon brothers, nature does not exist. The meaning of this thesis is that there are no laws of nature. The laws of nature have always been a political morphism projecting state laws into the surrounding world. Svetogor calls his poetic conception of imagination a teleology, which is, based, which is based on the instinct of immortality and is aimed at assertion of the maximum of the maximal existence. He writes, we have elevated this value to a goal in itself, thus formulating our teleological point of view. Our philosophy is first and foremost a great teleology and all philosophical problems are shaped by our glorious objectives." End of quote. We looked to our undying instinct for immortality and our unquenchable thirst for glorious creativity, trusting in our biocosmic consciousness of the objective world's reality. Objective reality is an infinite arena for the great struggle in which everything that, pro that possesses individuality and the integrity asserts its supreme existence. This is the end of the quote. And despite the fact that his plan, that his plans look fantastic, Sviatogor presses on its technical objectivity. Again a quote. In the struggle for biocosmism, it would be unthinkable either to imitate or concur with the religious or mystical order of things. Instead of immortality beyond the grave and immortality in the soul, our goal is to promote immortality here on earth, in the real universe, the immortality of the individual with all its spiritual and physical powers. Our relationship with religion and mysticism is therefore irredeemably negative. In the same way, instead of a dreamy, poetic, imaginative penetration of the universe, we favor a realistic interpretation of space travel as the immediate task of technology." End of quote. At the heart of the his technology is the question of techniques, of crack and the civilization, of bio and geo-hacking. He solves it in the framework of projects that he called vol volcanism and biocosmism. For Sviatogor, techniques is a technology of melting, flowing and becomings. And in the main, this technology is represented by him as poetry. His poetic works conjure up an impressive picture of a volcanic earth and molten creatures living on it.
not humans, not animals, not robots, but the pure flows of becomings. The question about is, techniques in Russian anarchic cosmism is one of the most complex and ambiguous. The difficulty is that the very concept of techniques was radically reinterpret, reinterpreted in anarcho-communism, in anarcho-cosmism. The techniques as flows and separations, the techniques of vulcanizing, the techniques of biohacking and geohacking undermined the prevailing instrumental concept of a technical object in the first half of the 20th century. In essence, the Russian anarchists of the 1920s invented techno-anarchism, which opposed itself to various raids on the, on the natural state, on nature. The most mysterious hyper-object of cosmists is the Earth as a technical object, spaceship. In a simple form, form, all three elements of the utopian thinking of the anarchists of the 1920s, language, imagination, techniques, are represented in the utopia of the Gordon brothers, the land of anarchy. Thus, this utopus becomes available to the oppressed five when they unite. There are no laws of nature, and the earth itself becomes a technical object in the land of anarchy. Despite the fact that the technical part of the project of the land of anarchy is spelled out in sufficient detail, its description as a utopia does not cease to be a challenge to the imagination. That's the end of the paper. <laughs> okay, so let's continue with uh, the next talk. Uh, it will be given by uh, Laura Hendrickson from Columbia University. Um, she is a master's degree student uh, with interests in the history of science fiction. And uh, her talk is titled Ideologies of the Future Soviet Science Fiction from 1953 to 1991. Okay, so. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, the relatively brief history of Soviet science fiction is sort of a trajectory of disillusionment. It was very optimistic in the days of the early 20th century, and then there was a downturn in publishing during the Stalin years, and a resurgence of utopia during the thaw, and then an eventual turn toward the dystopian. Uh, but science fiction's particular brand of futurism, focused on what might be rather than what was, allowed its authors some small degree of freedom within the confines of socialist realism. And this degree of permissiveness tolerated in the genre makes it a useful object of study from the perspective of cultural and intellectual history. Um, of particular interest to this paper is how the future-oriented perspective engaged with the state's ideology, which was resolutely anti-utopian, yet demanded perfection from the future societies that are portrayed in these science fiction works. Uh, so this paper will open with a brief historical overview and seek to understand the interactions between science fiction and official ideology, and then the role of the science fiction writer in Soviet society. Uh, so the thaw roughly coincided with the golden era of Soviet science fiction, which began with the publication <coughs> of Ivan Yefremov's The Andromeda Nebula in 1957, and lasted until 1973 when there was a purge of the science fiction wing in the journal Molodaya Gvardia. And during this time, a renewed interest in science was permitted, including research in the previously disallowed fields of quantum physics, relativity, cybernetics, and genetics which spurred innovations in both scientific knowledge and science fiction. And then by the end of Khrushchev's time in power, he had already declared that freedom of thought was only permitted in the realm of science and could not spill over into ideology, and this influenced Brezhnev's policies of controlling scientists. The economic stagnation of the period was mirrored in the stagnation of the genre in the 70s, when only about eight to 10 new science fiction works were being published per year, and many science fiction imprints were shut down. This low number of works published can be attributed in part to a central committee resolution that demanded stricter ideological control, which resulted in the, the dismissal of the editor of Maladaya Gvardia in 1973, and he was replaced by the nationalist science fiction writer Yuri Medvedev, whose influence was felt up until Perestroika. Uh, so this in the 70s, this downward trend in science fiction publishing continued through the 80s. Uh, during this time, some previously censored works were published, such as The Ugly Swans and The Snail on the Slope by the popular Strugatsky brothers. But overall, more attention was paid to works that dealt with the legacies of Stalinism. Uh, 
future-oriented science fiction stories maybe became less relevant during this period as the literature published focused more on the past and the internal affairs of the state. So prior to Glasnost, the only permissible style of fiction writing was socialist realism. Uh, published works had to adhere to realism, not as it was perceived by the writer, but how the state intended it to be. So how did science fiction, a self-described mode of fantasy, Naushnaya Fantastica, how did that cooperate with this directive? The answer lies in the specifics of the science fiction works. Now, John Glad has argued that Soviet science fiction was an anti-realistic movement aimed at overthrowing the official doctrine of socialist realism, but I find that it was more common that writers found ways to work within the limitations of this doctrine. Um, the restrictions imposed on science fiction included that implausible technologies such as time travel and the discovery of alternate universes were outright banned or strongly discouraged depending on the era. I think Stalin in particular did not enjoy time travel, so there were, that was, that was a no-go. Um, but cryogenics and the, the discovery of extraterrestrials were considered to be within the realm of possibility. So these limitations allowed science fiction works to conform to aspects of realism, but in a fantastical mode. So in 1958, there was this all-Russian conference on science fiction and adventure stories held in Moscow under the auspices of the Writers' Union. And there they outlined these four goals for science fiction works. One was to develop the capacity for dreaming and scientists. Another was to stir the expectation of realistic goals so that scientists would not be able to stop dreaming up new ideas. Uh, to create an atmosphere conducive to the flourishing of style in scientific literature and to develop a taste for science and scientific research in young people. These kind of lofty ideals they developed at the conference show that the science fiction was tasked with inspiring readers, so it was acceptable to stray somewhat from the strict realism so long as the works achieved these goals and fell within certain ideological constraints. So the relationship between official ideology and science fiction warrants some consideration. Um, because it was so tightly controlled by the state and tended to reflect the ideology, ideology of its times. As Ken McLeod puts it, I quote, in a society whose ideological justification was utopian and future-oriented, the relationship between the political establishment and science fiction was necessarily fraught. Stories were constrained by the state's ideological conception of the future as defined in Marxism-Leninism, for example, it was thought that for any civilization to develop the capacity for space travel, it would have first had to organize its society around communist principles according to the ideas of historical materialism. So this is why Soviet spacefarers would find friendly communist aliens rather than the alien monsters that were so prevalent in Western sci-fi as we saw in the presentation on film. The shift in ideology and move away from Stalinism in the late 1950s and early 1960s necessitated a change in ideology of science fiction as well. Um, the critic Raphael Nudelman describes a messianic strain in science fiction, and he says that national messianism was the most uh, mature and competitive ideology official alternative to the official one. And this is interesting because Maladaya Guardia was known to have a sort of nationalist bent and science, it saw science fiction as a way to reach the younger generation. So that might be a topic for future research, the interplay between nationalism and science fiction, although that's outside the scope of this paper. So science fiction's ideolo ideological contribution lies in its ties to myth. The scholar Tatyana Chernysheva links the genre with myth in that myths reflect people's knowledge about themselves and their world around them. Science uses myth in the form of hypothesis where there is insufficient information, and then these myths gain traction in the public mind and assume a life of their own, and science fiction is one way this sort of mythologization of scientific knowledge is accomplished. And so if myth is an organizational scheme for comprehending human knowledge of the world, ideology is a similar function in the political realm. Um, as the genre of science fiction turns scientific knowledge into myth, in the Soviet context, science fiction mythologizes ideology through its portrayals of the imagined communist future. 
It uses the framework of Marxism-Leninism to bolster the ideological concepts of scientific and historical progress, and science fiction in the Soviet Union served to unite the technological possibilities of scientific research with the Marxist-Leninist conception of the future founded on the idea of the inexorable progress toward a communist society. And Marx didn't write so much about what the society would look like because he didn't want to be called an idealist, so this left that open for science fiction writers to explore. And so the creation of ideological myth in science fiction is tied to the utopian Marxist project of the Soviet Union. And so the utopian socialists considered themselves realists and not dreamers. They objected to the word utopia because they wanted it to be scientific, realistic, practical, even though the ideas they're outlining sort of it's designing a society that looks an awful lot like a utopia. So it's an interesting contradiction there. And Marx also criticized socialist works that failed to make mention of historical development and political struggle. And here we have a quote from Lenin that comes down very hard against utopia because it has to be based on the development of a political and class forces. So this official ideology of the Soviet Union is condemning utopian thought. Um, so how did science fiction resolve this conflict since utopia played such a large role in science fiction works? And the same as before, the answer is that they restricted the possible topics and themes in genre works. So science fiction writing sort of became the repository of imagination that was forbidden to political thinkers. But even as economic plans were limited to five years in the future, the scope of science fiction was limited to the relatively near future. They could only go maybe a hundred years out. They couldn't go a thousand years out. That would be too wild. That would, that would just throw everything off. So the futurism of science fiction is seen as filling the function of inspiring new generations of communists and therefore utopian elements were allowed, but only in service of this goal. So this brings us to the role of the science fiction writer in Soviet society. I found some debates among literary critics in the 1960s. Uh, the science fiction writer and engineer Vladimir Nemtsov published an article in Izviestia in 1966. And here's a quote from him. He said, science fiction literature should be available to everybody, especially young readers. It needs to inspire them fire their youthful hearts with the desire to make these dreams come true. So science fiction is seen as integral to the building of a communist society. So the utopianism that Marx rejected was encouraged here in service of a clear ideological purpose, and that sort of fits in with the goals of socialist realism as well. And then in response to this article, uh, it was published by Ivan Yefremov in Komsomolskaya Pravda, and it argued that science fiction is literature, and as such is not and cannot be a prophetic preview of an integrated picture of the future, and that its vision of the future can and must be just as varied as real life itself, just as unlimited and inexhaustible as man's knowledge of the world. And Yefremov was, you know, he was a very famous writer, and so his emphasizing the artistic aspects of this genre is perhaps, you know, not unexpected. Um, he's interested in expressing deeper human truths rather than just filling this ideological role, but his was sort of the minority view at this time. Another contribution to this debate came from a professor Fedorovich, a scientist who published in Literaturnaya Gazeta to argue for the importance of ideology in science fiction. He wrote that one cannot but remember at the same time the demands for social clarity in the author's positions. It is necessary always to keep in mind that every Soviet book, including science fiction, is not only entertaining reading, but also, first and foremost, a means of educating man. So Fedorovich and Nemtsov are agreeing that science fiction can't just be entertainment, but it plays a very important role in the ideological development of its readers. So from this debate, we can see how ideologically significant this sort of fantastic genre was. It was not just considered entertainment, it filled a purpose in society to educate and inspire a future generation of communists. So we've seen that ideolo ideology played a large role in shaping science fiction works in the Soviet Union. 
whether it was the confines of socialist realism that applied to certain plot devices, or the dictates of historical materialism that structured their view of the future. The mythologization of ideology accomplished in Soviet science fiction is the key in understanding how the genre functioned as a political tool and how the state conceived of its future and its place in the world. The utopian element in the Marxist-Leninist conception of the future and its inevitable progress towards full communism found expression in genre works, um, and the point was to inspire new generations of communists. Um, so this contradiction between the anti-utopian sentiments of Marx and Lenin and the utopian elements of Soviet science fiction speaks to the difficult role of the genre writer in Soviet society who is tasked with inventing a future worthy of Marx's ideas without going too far beyond the confines of socialist realism. So for future research, a closer look at the content of specific science fiction texts from this period might reveal exactly what kinds of possible futures were envisioned in them, what the ideological constraints were, and what strategies might have been used by some authors to subvert the official ideology. two are uh, open for discussion. Uh, let me first, before the discussion started, to share some, uh, some thought of mine that uh, I was expecting to hear in these three talks the name of Strugatsky Brothers, and these, <laughs> these names didn't appear. They did. So, where? They did, yeah. Where? Well, somebody talked about the Brothers Okay, okay, so let's start the discussion and then we can hear this talk. <laughs> the Strugatsky brother appeared, right? Somebody's. She talked about Snell and Slope being published. Yeah. So uh, uh, suddenly the, uh, I have the microphone, so um, I have a lot of questions, of course, it was very, very interesting, so thank you so much. And I'm glad that this uh, paradox uh, did indeed appear, because the official ideology was against utopia, and it was explicitly against utopia, it was against utopia uh, basing itself on Engels, but it was also against utopia because it claimed that it, uh, the whole theory of uh, um, what the future communism holds for us is based on, on Marx's uh, theory of value. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's indeed the whole system was far more paradoxical, complicated, um, heterogeneous than we like it to be in order to make explanation easy. So it's, and and in, uh, in between this heterogeneous uh, strait, of course, it was possible to, to maneuver for, for writers and for ordinary people and, and to try to, to find their, their freedom. So, for example, uh, beginning from, from the end, I would immediately ask you, said, which is probably true, that the 70s were sort of down on, on science fiction because of growing restrictions, indeed, after the, the Prague events. Uh, there was a new freezing uh, of, uh, of everything. But still, this is the, the decade when uh, Tarkovsky, uh, Tarkovsky, Solaris, and, and, and Stalker appeared. And they are indeed um, amazing examples of, of science fiction, which doesn't fit any ideological constraint. And they open up a lot of questions. So the, there was this. There was the writing that was going on, and there was also the problem of what got translated, because there was also translation going on in, in Russian, I believe, a lot, but also, as we know, in Bulgaria. And, and uh, the, the specific uh, uh, filters for, for these translations uh, are very interesting, because they may have been uh, paraded as ideological, but they also quality control. So we only got the good science fiction and not and not the, you know, all the crap that, that, it, that so, so, yeah, yeah, and also yeah, yeah. Lem, I mean, Stanislav Lem was also discussing this. Um, so, anyway, I also have uh, questions about this amazing paper on, uh, on, um, on anarchy. So, I, I don't know how we go. Who's going to 
who is going to write, but I really want to know more about this guy, whether this text was published in any, in any uh, language, and, uh, and whether, uh, what was the connection between this group and, and Fyodorov, uh, through what people it went, what was their connection to Hlebnikov and, and to other avant-garde writers. You know that Gordon, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's, I have, it's a pity he's as not as here. A whole book. The, the, yeah, a whole book that's based mostly on Seattle and I believe, and I guess there will be. I'd, I'd love to have the title. Uh, I, 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 I think it's Seattle. Yeah, it's yeah. It's published in Russian. No, I mean, the, 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 that's the, the title of the book itself. So, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, the, and it's published super recently. Yeah, and, and then again, uh, a question to the first paper, and I stop. Uh, is um, uh, with Lem, um, uh, uh, th this is really very true, his, his idea that uh, uh, this oppressive uh, ideal of happiness is, is totally counterproductive. But don't, don't you think it is also as much directed at uh, uh, what uh, uh, was uh, capitalism at, at his time and what we get today? He yeah, is yeah. totally against both communism and capitalism. What, one of the thing, one of the aspects of Lem's thinking that I find so charming, is the fact he's against most things. <laughs> no. Uh, no, really. Uh, I mean, essentially, he, he's a philosopher. Essentially, not not a sci-fi writer. Um, and it seems to me that what he argues for more than anything is lucidity and honesty. You know, not to pretend. That is why this notion of that's why dreams and actually. It's becoming very clear how dreams function all the time in most science fiction, right? You know, and in part, uh, there's a notion of the dream as this image of a possible future, but there's also the notion of a dream, right, as the uh, occasion for repressed things to surface. And we have this, of course, in Solaris, don't we? Yeah. So yes, he was very much against both the West and the East. So I'm not sure maybe the ideal place for him would have been Africa. Well, he likes Pinky, I think. Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. So, yes, uh-huh. <laughs> no, it just also occurs to me, and I don't know, I, I also am very interested in Sviatogor because Sviatogor actually is a mythical uh, Russian folk hero who defends the country, defends various values and so on, and who then passes on that job to um, ah, um, to the next Ilya Muromets, who is the next epic hero. And what's interesting is Fyodor himself gets turned into a mountain. So he's both naturalized and he's made a part of the landscape, which is really phenomenal. Do you know anything about it? Where is the reader? Drago? Oh, oh, hi, Drago. Oh, Do you know? Your question. Yes, I'm also. I would love to know. What the whole theory of bestialism is, it sounds as though it's a reversal of what Wells and Bulgakov present in their works, but there wasn't enough said about this to make that clear. But I find that I love bestialism. I think it's fascinating. So. <laughs> okay, some other questions. I wanted to ask you. Uh, oh. <laughs> Uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there was a statement in your paper about utopia to define history and time, this temporal yes. aspect of utopia. Mm -hmm. and that's a very broad. That's a very broad yes. claim, yes. I think. And but if utopia is achieved, that means that the perfect system is achieved, right? So in other words, that's yes. the very basis. But and anything else then has to refine it. Yeah, but I mean a bit different aspect, like simply history of utopian literature. I'm not an expert, but I read the paper lately, and there was like exact moment when the, where the author said where utopia turns to Euchronia. There is also this this, this term, and he he names the the utopian uh, work Memoirs of the Year 2500. It's a French uh, French uh, text, um, and this futurism appears um, since then in utopian uh, texts and 
also in the first socialist realist uh, novels by Lenin. Mm -hmm. There were like this, those two uh, famous uh, astronauts and Magellan Nebula. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't like he didn't like those texts in the end, and he, he d didn't want to, to be published, but they, they're still there, and they are very futuristic and like utopian futurist, and, and, and they play in like 2800 or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, do you, uh, what's, can you, can you elaborate on this? Well, as far as Lem's concerned, you know, I mean, I mean, yes, Yes, as I said, you know, I think the notion, if you look at the word, I'm very linguistically inclined, so if you look at the word utopia, it does say the perfect place. The very definition of perfection, right, is suggest a terminus ad quem, right? It's there set. And it seems to me that the notion of time introduced into it, then that already is a second step, and that is, it seems to me, an editing of the notion of utopia, or a refinement of what wants. Do you know what I mean? And I know of very few works which are utopian, which actually have that built in. Do you know what I mean? The no There's like looking backwards from 2000 to like... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -mm. But, you know, again, any time you make a generalization, you're talking about the majority of texts. You know? And it seems to me the notion of temporal mobility and of change, okay, uh, and usually that would usually be evolution, not revolution, I would say, right? Uh, that seems to me to be in a minority of cases, okay? No, but as I say, any generalization, who is it? Coleridge said to generalize is to be an idiot, thereby undermining his own generalization. <laughs> no. So, yes, yeah, so, so your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. I want to answer you about Bologna because like what Kuzarik means, he just says that uh, at some point, just uh, at some point, uh, utopia stops to be placed in the space and then placed in time, but it doesn't mean that it changes in itself. So it is again a static, uh, perfect society. So it doesn't matter. If it is. Uh, future futurist, futuristic uh, society. It is uh, uh, further in time or back in time. In both uh, cases, it is the same thing as in near uh, as uh, in It is uh, in the future, but it is again a static society. So in this case, uh, it doesn't mean that Ukraine means that this uh, uh, mobile or it is uh, temporality is uh, inside. But it is still a modification. It is. It okay. is. It is. Because time I becomes really important yes. in a way, but it doesn't mean that the society built, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the society that is built doesn't really change. So mm -hmm. morality doesn't enter in the society, in the structure. But really, this whole uh, structure moves mm -hmm. in time and in space, which is really very interesting in the context and in the time. And of course, the biggest, the bigger question is why in this exactly time uh, utopia becomes Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. That is something well, very and here I'd like to quote Bakhtin, the notion of the chronotope: when one is more developed, the other one is less developed. Yes. And so on. that's what we're talking about. Yeah, but it, I still, I, don't, I mean, I agree with him and his criticism of me. <laughs> you know, I think that there is a modification. Um, I have a question for Laura. Um, I was curious about these like stated goals of, of SF under, under communism and uh, this idea of the educational function or educational mandate of the science fictional text. Um, and I was curious if that education is necessarily ideological education or can also be more pragmatic uh, and be concerned with the dissemination of like concrete scientific knowledge. And I'm thinking of like Sokovsky's Beyond Earth and using science fiction as a vessel for smuggling in uh, sort of approachable, accessible, concrete scientific knowledge as a way of popularizing it and kind of uh, executing this other stated goal of, of basically catalyzing youth interest in science fiction research. Um, and uh, so basically I'm, a related question to that is um, in your research did you encounter any information about how these 
texts um, entered into curriculum and how they were taught in schools and whether or not they were tried, they were mobilized as a kind of instructional device for for school children and whether or not other writing aside from so called Speaks Beyond Earth like attempted to actually um, smuggle concrete scientific knowledge, not speculative knowledge, but real knowledge into fictional texts. I'm not sure about um, smuggling knowledge in so much. And as far as the educational goals were concerned, I don't think it was instituted in the curriculum, but there were youth clubs associated with science fiction journals that would seek to gather together young people and cultivate enthusiasm for science and for communism. Um, so I'm not aware of science fiction being used in the classroom as such, but I think it was like an extracurricular goal um, for these sort of fan club type of things. Most of the uh, famous Soviet scientists, there was, uh, the writers, there were scientists. In example, Altschuler, he became a uh, science fiction writer because he was uh, supposed to earn for a living, not uh, so. And then uh, science fiction was built into the trist practice as a way of break the limitations of the mind. So this is where the science fiction was built in, uh, in, um, in courses in trist. I don't know whether you know what is trist, but this is theory of inventive, inventive problem solving that was developed by out of then Amnoel, Bilenkin, and Juravlova, all these people were uh, concerned in, with the invention, not with the literature. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I, as far as I know, that in um, uh, in the school program uh, during the comp uh, these works of science fiction were not enlisted on the compulsory list of books, but every year students used to have about thirty or 40 titles of, it was uh, uh, advisable but almost compulsory reading and there there were at least few titles of science fiction then as it was already mentioned there were uh, extracurricular clubs of uh, fans and uh, um, actually there was also an exam at schools of astronomy, there were at least 10 exams and you can choose astronomy, and there you can't avoid, of course, knowing something about science fiction. So it was not in built compulsory in the program, but it was always somewhere within the reach. If you want it, you can get it always. Mm -hmm. And people read more. I think this, um, the big role was also uh, in, in popularizing science fiction, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and through those popular scientific journals like mm -hmm. Technica Młodzieży, mm -hmm. UNOS, and uh, I think, uh, and uh, I think this Efremov uh, novel uh, Andromeda Nebula, mm -hmm. it was published like uh, in small pieces, like through throughout uh, a couple of years, in, in Technica Młodzieży. When I'm not sure. <laughs> Not to forget. No, no. no. It, was, was it, it was sufficient. It was sufficient. They had like real, special, real yeah. huge um, 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 so numbers of copies, like millions. But Urowski Sledepit was the journal where, in example, Ulitka Naskonie was published. This uh, famous book of Strugatsky. Maybe you don't know.